Well, thank you and good afternoon. It's great to be back in Sofia at a special place in my heart for, for Bulgaria. Um, long before I'd ever visited here, I had many friends and colleagues who were among some of the craziest, most interesting educators I'd ever met. So it's a great honor to spend some time with you today. I apologize in advance to the translators. Even when I try to speak slowly, I speak quickly. Um, and I have translated almost all of the slides into, into Bulgarian, thanks to my, my colleague Leyuba. Um, so if the translations are awful, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, some resources that may be of use to you related to things that we're going to be talking about during the presentation are there, and you can share those later as well. So I want to begin with some major principles, ideas that really drive my work. The first is that kids are competent. They're capable of doing great things. They're capable of being, being reliable. They're capable of being trusted. And our educational system needs to behave in, in a way that's consistent with the competency of children. Really big idea. Young people have a remarkable capacity for intensity. Young people have a remarkable capacity for intensity. And if we don't build upon that remarkable capacity for intensity, it may, it may manifest itself as boredom or misbehavior or ennui or perhaps just worst of all, wasted potential. This is a photograph I took 25 years ago in one of the first schools where every kid had a laptop. And the children were programming in Logo. And if you see the kid in the center of the screen, in the time that elapsed between hitting the return key and awaiting the result to appear on the screen, every ounce of his being is mobilized in anticipation of the result. And I have the great fortune of spending a lot of times in schools all over the world. I've already flown 85,000 miles just this year. And when I encounter a child like that, it's not long before the teacher takes me aside and says, he's not very good at school. And the way that I diagnose that phenomena is that there's an acute intensity imbalance between his sense of himself, his abilities, the world in which he lives and how people actually learn that doesn't match the pace and the intensity of the classroom. We have an obligation to introduce children to things they don't yet know they love. This is one of the only reasons that school will remain viable into the future, to introduce children to things they don't yet know they love. That doesn't mean we have to pander and we have to teach them fractions via rap, but it does mean it does mean that this is the way we sustain a culture and a democracy and a civilization. I think the smallest unit of concern to an educator should be the project. The project creates all the experience, it makes connections between disciplines, it makes bring people together and ideas and gives you access to powerful ideas. If, you're, if you have a hypothesis, you communicate it to the computer or the materials you're working with or your peers, and when you're successful, you're inspired to test a larger hypothesis, decorate, embellish, ask another question. If you're unsuccessful, you have to engage in debugging processes. But the project should be our major concern. I want to live in a world where kids wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and are counting the minutes until they return back to the classroom to continue working on some project that matters to them. And in a world where the teachers wake up every morning and ask themselves, how do we make this the best seven hours of a kid's life? I'm not a futurist, I don't have a crystal ball, but I will make one prediction about the future, and that is that schools will not continue to enjoy the current monopoly they hold over children's time. What do I mean by that? I mean kids will go to school less than they do today. Now how do I know that I'm right? Because every politician on earth says the exact opposite. But we also know that when we were an agrarian society, Kids stayed home on the farms with their families when parents went off to factories, kids went off to factory schools. Now, because of just changing nature of work, kids are spending more time at home, there are more places to learn things, and school's going to really need to be able to answer the question, why do the kids even show up? How do we gain benefit from being co-located in the same space at the same time? Ironically, it is the things that school devalues the most. Art, music, drama, actual science, excursions, real experiences that will make school viable into the future. 
Much of the things that people are concerned about that are measured by PISA tests are things that don't have to happen in school. They hardly justify kids getting up before sunrise and taking a bus somewhere. My friend Seymour Papert once pointed out that schools at best teach one billionth of a percent of the knowledge in the world, and yet we argue endlessly over which billionth of a percent is important. This is preposterous. And the biggest idea of all, which is going to be the theme for all the examples I'm about to share with you, is the Piagetian idea that knowledge is a consequence of experience. Knowledge is a consequence of experience. There's research coming out of places like Stanford University that's demonstrating that if kids have an experience before the lecture, before they watch a movie, their understanding of the concept is dramatically greater than if they had attended the lecture or seen the movie or read the chapter in the book before the experience. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, the experience never comes. I would actually hypothesize that the experience can often substitute for the lecture, for the reading the chapter, for the watching the movie. The only question we need to be able to answer is what can the students do? And when you're thinking about curriculum, you should be asking the question, what can they do with that idea? What can they do with that concept? So one of the things that we need to be doing as educators is looking for trends outside of schools that can support our dreams, that can challenge us, that can provide new opportunities. And although I've been advocating for 35 years about learning by doing and robotics and computer programming, I worked with Seymour Papert for more than 20 years, there was this movement called the Maker Movement that emerged about 10 years ago, where people were coming together and re-energizing timeless craft traditions of knitting and sewing and crocheting and painting and horticulture and beekeeping and and they were supercharging them with all kinds of new digital technology and then using the internet as an accelerant that was allowing them to share their ideas, to, to construct knowledge across great distances. And soon after the, the maker movement was born, the self-described maker said, wouldn't it be great if we could come together and share what we know, challenge one another, teach each other. And the maker fairs were born. At a maker fair you might see a giant mouse trap or people driving cupcakes around, and you may have informal and formal sessions on soldering and knitting and crocheting and welding and computer programming and building giant robots out of cardboard boxes. And everywhere you look at a maker fair, there are children and adults learning together, delighting in one's company. I should mention that the, the San Francisco Maker Fair attracts 150,000 attendees. Rome and New York get about 120,000. There were over a hundred mini maker fairs around the world, and those were the official ones. There was probably a thousand unofficial ones. And when you see these adults and children learning together, these are the most engaged parents, right? These are the parents that teachers say they want to have in their schools. And while I fully expected that parents would tell me their children were bored in school, what I didn't expect was the frequency with which parents at maker fairs tell me school is killing my child. They say, look what my kid can do, and no one cares. Look what my kid can do, and every night we have to send them to bed crying over a mathematics worksheet. And while some people who are talking about the future of education would say, we just have to get rid of schools, we have to disrupt them, we have to be transformative and revolutionary, I'm not willing to give up on schools because that's where the children are. And I think it's really important that we preserve this institution if we care about democracy, if we care about culture. You know, this is, this is a time where the world is in, in turmoil, but there have never been more exciting opportunities for learners. One of the things that I really love about the maker movement is there are children who are at the center of it, who are heralded and cherished and beloved and respected, not just because they're cute, but because they know things, because they have expertise. And they also delight in the company of adults. The kid in the blue t-shirt is Kane of Kane's Arcade. <coughs> A nine-year-old boy who became famous overnight when he had to go to work with his father over the summer at his junkyard, and when he got bored, he started making an arcade out of cardboard boxes. And a video was posted on YouTube about it, and it was seen by a few trillion people. And he raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for university, and he went to the White House, and he was on television all the time. And then on his 11th birthday, he told a reporter in the United States that he was retiring, and none of us have heard from him since. 
And what I love about that is kids are being able to be entrepreneurs and engineers and you know, microcontroller programmers in the same way that previous generations of children tried on the roles of astronaut or nurse or doctor or fireman. You know, there's this idea that tech, that technology, um, there's this idea that we shouldn't change schools because technology exists, and I would argue the contrary. It's irresponsible to not change schools because of changes in technology. Schools have always been governed by the technology of a previous era. There's no reason to suggest that what's now available in the lives of kids shouldn't be used as a way to amplify human potential. This idea is often manifest in education settings by people saying that technology changes all the time. If only we could keep up. Well, the sad reality is that not just in countries like Bulgaria, but in the United States and everywhere else, much of what we do with computers in schools is exactly the same as we did 25 years ago or less. I, I followed the Minister for Education in the Philippines a few months ago who said, would you believe there are classrooms in the Philippines that aren't connected to the internet? And I, I got up and I said, there are classrooms in America that aren't connected to the internet. <laughs> However, there are times in history where the technology does change. And I think we're in one of those moments. So in our book, Invent to Learn, we, we suggest that there are three categories of game changers. The first is fabrication. Until recently, the only thing you could make on a computer lived on a screen or spit out on paper. Now, with laser cutters and 3D printers, you can make real things. Now, the power of this isn't that every seventh grader can make an identical Star Wars keychain, but that for the first time in history, children have had access to the Z-axis, that they can design in 3D, and more importantly, they can make the thing they need to solve a particular problem. Physical computing, the idea that we can add interactivity and intelligence to everyday objects. We can think of this as robotics, but we could also make, you know, we can make shirts that have directional signals in the back made out of lights, and we throw a switch on our sleeve to indicate which way we're turning when we ride our bike home from school, or we make a necklace that alerts us when our least favorite teacher is approaching. <laughs> and the third idea is computer programming. And I like to say that computer programming is the new liberal art. We should be teaching kids programming because not just that it may give them a job, but that it, that it gives them agency over an increasingly complex and technologically sophisticated world. And it's fun. And it's intellectually rich. And it answers the question that Seymour Papert began asking almost 50 years ago. Does the computer program the child or the child program the computer? This is a question that should be of concern to all parents and educators and citizens. So making is a stance, it's a way of viewing the world with the confidence and competence that I can solve any problem I confront, even if only to discover that I need to learn a lot more. That the role of the teacher going forward is to prepare children to solve problems that none of us have even thought of. And the best maker's face is the one you find between your ears. It's not a place you go to on an excursion every two weeks. I want kids to be able to make things within arm's reach in every corner of the school throughout the school day. Because it's not just a way of expressing oneself, it's also a way of constructing knowledge. So when we're talking about making things, it doesn't just have to be a volcano or a robot. It can be a poem or a, or a, um, a theory or a song. It's about children being mathematicians rather than being taught mathematics. It's about being historians rather than being taught history. It's about being scientists rather than being taught science. So here's a video of, of two sixth graders working with Lego. Watch the blonde kid. <laughs> So he jumps up in class, smacks his hands together, and yells like a boss. Because he's so excited about the breakthrough he just experienced. And he has no self-consciousness about doing this because he's completely lost in the flow of what he's doing. And you may notice that none of his classmates are, are disrupted by it, interrupted, because they're all equally engaged in what they're doing. Now when kids are making things, they tell us that they view the world differently. And they view their role in the world and their own intellectual power in a superior fashion. Papert said, if you can make things with computers, then you can make a lot more interesting things and you can learn a lot more by making them. We're adding colors to the crayon box. 
we're extending the breadth and depth and range of projects that are possible. And yet these new tools are wholly consistent with the best principles of early childhood education and of, of, of developmental psychology. This is a photograph of the robot petting zoo I took at Maker Faire about five years ago, where parents queued up for their toddlers to spend a few minutes in the pen with robots that beeped and burped and squawked and ran away when they chased them. And if you watch these babies with the robots, their behavior was indistinguishable from had there been real animals in the pen. It reminds us of something that Alan Kay said. Alan Kay invented the personal computer, and he likes to say that technology is anything that wasn't there before you were born. If kids come to us with no more than the gift of, of lack of fear, it, it's our responsibility to channel it, to challenge it, to take it further than it could have on our own. So let's say you're a perfect school that's Reggio-inspired, that's child-centered, that, that's modeled on the Finnish model, um, and kids are happy and teachers love being there. What is it that is making ads? And I think there are at least four things. One is enhanced expressiveness. What do I mean by that? I mean that if it was okay in the past to make a puppet out of a cereal box, and now you can make a puppet out of a cereal box that sings and dances and sends a text message to your mother, why wouldn't you encourage a kid to make that puppet? The second area is precision and reliability. Not just the ability to follow directions accurately or to measure and cut precisely, but to create reliably reproducible phenomena. What do I mean by that? I mean I made something that works now, it works after lunch, it works tomorrow. And that experience with making something that's stable, that's reliable, is a powerful idea that far too few kids have had access to. They have the ability to make real things. When you can make real things, the, the knowledge is more authentic. And we make complexity accessible. Kids have access to domains of knowledge and ways of doing and knowing that a few years ago were science fiction. So here's an example. This is a two-year-old playing with little bits. Little bits are magnetic, snapped together, electronic elements that allow you to build prototypes of systems or, or incredibly complex um, full systems. And it's impossible to have a syntax error or electrocute yourself or break anything because the pieces only go together one way. But this two-year-old is playing with these materials, and watch her. I think so. I was doing a little bit, I can see it. Put your finger on it, you'll be able to feel it. Can you feel it? She's doing a tiny little bit. She has a potentiometer she's using to adjust the voltage and a vibrating motor as the output. <laughs> oh! That's funny. So five years ago, this was in a lab at MIT. Now it's a birthday present. And his two-year-old is being an engineer. Right? Engineering is the the application of theoretical principles in the world, right? Um, and yet, who gets to be an engineer? Those people who suffered through 12 or 14 years of abstraction successfully in school. This kid, in, and lots of kids like her, are experiencing what it means to be an engineer long before they come to school, and they're not going to tolerate a curriculum that's based on sit down and shut up, or memorizing five facts about invertebrates. I want to share this little clip with you. This is Alan Alda, the actor from MASH, hosting a science program in the United States where he's visiting Professor Neil Gershenfeld at MIT. And Gershenfeld began teaching a course 15 years ago called How to Make Almost Anything. And in his class, he expected that only the most advanced engineering students would have any interest in such a class. And much to his surprise and delight, children camp out overnight, students, adults, young adults, camp out overnight for a chance to get into this class because it's a basic human desire to make things. And he predicted that the next major revolution in technology was going to be desktop manufacturing, personal fabrication. That in the past, if you wanted to buy your father a birthday present, you had to get off work in time to go to the shops, hope they had what you wanted, drive to see your father, wait until he visited. Now you can go online, pick out the watch, and have it delivered to your father. Gershenfeld suggested that in the very near future, 
You'd go online, find two or three watches you like, combine the best features of each, put a picture of the grandchildren on the face, and email the watch to your father and he'll print it himself. So in this video, little video clip, he's talking about this idea and all of the prices that are mentioned, all the costs of the technology, you can divide by 100 now. This is already about eight years old. If I had one of these machines at home, you could email me this bike. My sister actually was emailed this bicycle in Sydney and she's riding one around. You kidding? No, seriously. Isn't that incredible? So wait a minute, so that means that if I order a bike from a company someday, it won't come in a truck. It'll cut, all, everybody will have one of these machines, and a lot of what we order, lamps, furniture, bicycles, will get emailed to us. We'll have it a few seconds later. The only thing wrong in what you said is it's not when you order the bicycle, it's when you design the bicycle. <laughs> when you design the bicycle. <laughs> okay. Did, did you recognize what this is? This is actually a, a model of Matisse's Blue Nude number two. Um, you can see the, the leg here, the hind leg, uh, another leg here on the thigh, the arch of the back, uh, the head and the hand holding the front wheel. In this How to Make Anything project, um, it's not just that students learn to make a bicycle, they learn to make their bicycle. Every bicycle is different, and part of expressing yourself in the bicycle you want is what this is all about. Okay, all right, this will be great. Listen, uh, work on that thing for you. <laughs> so off I went on what is certainly the first nude bicycle. Okay, so let's say your imagination won't allow you to appreciate designing a nude bicycle and emailing it to your holiday destination and printing it when you arrive. What are the educational implications of this? Well, it not only blurs the artificial boundaries between subject areas and dissolves the distinctions between what we consider art and science, technology and humanities, engineering, but it also once and for all obliterates the dangerous and destructive cleavage between what we have long considered vocational education and academic education. Because when the same tools, techniques, processes, materials are required and found in the art studio, the physics laboratory, and the auto shop, we can and must stop sorting children into winners and losers. And ladies and gentlemen, this isn't just a way of helping the dumb kids or the kids who haven't been good at school become part of the educational mainstream. This is a direct threat and challenge to the students who have been good at school, who have been academically successful, who are going into a world that's unpredictable where they're going to be asked to solve problems that you haven't taught them how to solve, and many of those problems are going to require them making something, either in code or with their hands. And We've overvalued learning with one's head. The future is going to require that we learn equally with one's head, heart, and hands. I have three adult children, all university educated. The only one who has lived on her own every second since she graduated university with, a house, with an apartment and a job and health insurance is my daughter Yvonne, who was an art major in university. I am confident that school counselors aren't telling kids this. Yvonne has a job where she's drawing and animating and managing teams in India and programming and designing websites, front and back end. And then in her spare time, she does things like knitting a dress that walked New York Fashion Week in four days. Four days after work. She got the call before the, five days before the event. And in her spare time, she's taking a course at a local university at night in industrial knitting and, and, and weaving, where she has access to two-story high computer-assisted weaving machines that no one would have possibly would have access to otherwise. Um, it's impossible to predict where kids are going to end up and what the jobs of the future are going to be. So the best thing we can do is help them get through school without hating it, and, and trying to create productive context for learning in which they, they know what it's like to become good at something. And where they have the goals set for the future that, that are inspired by the same forces that drive scientists and mathematicians and musicians and artists. It is finding something that bugs you and spending the rest of your life 
trying to eliminate that bug. I want to introduce you to my friend, super awesome Sylvia. I discovered her when she was eight years old. I didn't really discover her. She was there already. But she had started going to maker fairs a couple years earlier, and she became really excited about do-it-yourself electronics and engineering and programming, and she wanted to share her enthusiasm and her knowledge with the world. So with a little help from her father, she began making a series of shows for the web that she modestly titled Super Awesome Sylvia's Super Awesome Maker Show. And in this one video I want to share with you, which I've heavily edited for time, she's talking about this microcontroller that has inputs and outputs that can sense information from the outside world and then turn on motors and servos and lights and talk to the internet and how you could use this thing to make instruments that would allow you to conduct your own science experiments. So in this case, she's going to build a strobe that's going to allow her to experiment with persistence of vision. And I just want you to watch two minutes of this video and think about this in terms of the eight-year-old you know. and a voltage between 0 and 5 volts to analog pin 2. This value is read by the Arduino as a number between 0 and 1023. Then using a little math, this number becomes the delay value for our stroke. Now I take the source code available at tn42.com slash stroke and upload it to the Arduino. Now that our code is compiled and uploaded, we can experiment. Here's one of my desk fans. We remove the front grill so we can see it better. Now we just turn on the Arduino and turn off the lights. By turning the potentiometer, it looks like it changes the speed of the fan, eventually slowing it down to a crawl. It's really still moving pretty fast though, so don't touch it. If you don't have a potentiometer, you can substitute any number you want for the analog read value in the code. It won't be easy to change, but with some trial and error, you can have it tuned in no time. The company in my dad made is open to any number of adjustments in the main speed and output. You can even add a display to guess the RPM of spinning objects. The possibilities go on and on. Okay, so that's what eight years old could look like. Now, there's a number of things I want to point out here. One is, when I speak to kids, I ask, how many of you have used the World Wide Web to answer a question or to learn how to do something? And everyone's hand goes up. And then I ask, and how many of you have put something up on the web that can help someone else solve a problem? And most of the hands go down. It seems to me that that's a reasonable expectation in 2017, that you share what you know with a, with a worldwide audience. Um, the other thing is, this is certainly better than making a PowerPoint presentation on a topic you don't care about for an audience you're never going to need. And there's a thousand things I could talk about in this video, but I just want to focus on this one moment for a second. 
She's talking about the way that you get the light to flash, and you do that by sending a, a voltage between zero and five volts through the Arduino board. And you communicate that value by changing the, a number in your program for a range between zero and 1,023. And then she matter-of-factly says, then using a little math, you can determine the delay value for your strobe. Well, that's the entire K-9 to math curriculum everywhere in the world, in that one example. Any kid who can solve that problem is well on their way, right? And yet, we spend years and years and years and don't get kids to that level of fluency. I'm going to come back to that idea in a moment. Because I, I would argue that if our, if our aspirations, if our goals and our dreams are no more ambitious than improving achievement on the existing math curriculum, which is junk worldwide, then we ought to be teaching kids computer programming and engineering. Because with absent programming and engineering, there's almost no context for actually using any of the mathematics we teach the kids. I was in a school in Los Angeles where I watched a teacher give a 43-minute lecture on absolute value. And at the end of the lecture, I asked her, what would you use that for? And she shrugged and said, I don't know, maybe seventh grade. Well, it seems that if you're trying to land your spaceship on your planet in your video game, absolute value comes in really handy. If you're trying to make a robot navigate an unfamiliar terrain, you might use absolute value. But on, on paper, it's of no consequence, it's of no use, it's completely irrelevant. So we can be programming environments like Turtle Art, a version of Logo that we, we communicate to the computer and we create these beautiful images that wouldn't even be possible maybe with pen and paper or, or paintbrush. And yet it's very simple block programming that creates incredible complexity. But let's say we want to look at this in an interdisciplinary context. We want to explore mosaic tiling and make this part of history and language arts and, and mathematics and art. Well, Former student of mine, a colleague, Josh Berker, did this with fourth graders. He had the kids program patterns in turtle art. He then cropped the images. He converted the file format so that different software would like it. And then he opened the file in Tinkercad, which is a 3D design package that's free. And he extruded the image. He lifted it up. He turned a 2D image into 3D. Then if he sends that file to the 3D printer, he can make these cookie cutters that can be used for making cookies or playing with Play-Doh. Or if given ceramic clay, you can stamp them into the squares of clay, fire them, hand paint them, and end up with these extraordinarily beautiful, precise works of art. That could be a Mother's Day gift, but they could also be a, a footpath in the school garden or a wall in the entryway to the school. And what I love about this project is three things. One is it goes from the digital to analog. It goes from the screen to something I can hold in my hand. The second, it goes from mathematics to art. You couldn't have created this without communicating mathematical ideas to the computer. Now, I know some of you had a teacher who had a yellowing Escher poster in the back of the room. And if you asked, why is that there in math class, they might say there's math in it. But it never really made any sense to you. Here, you couldn't create it without math. And the third reason why I think this is significant is in the 30 seconds it took me to share this project with you, you know how to do it yourself. Here are two boys I met, they were 10 years old, they built a marimba out of PVC pipe and wood. They composed music for the marimba, they could play it. And they told me something that was really exciting. They said that in order to determine how long the tube should be so that they could temper the scale for their marimba, they had to use a mathematical calculation based on the diameter of the tube and the frequency of the note they wanted to reproduce. And they said we were capable of doing that mathematics but we didn't think some of our classmates were, and we wanted them to participate. Which I loved. It demonstrated either a great deal of empathy or hubris. I'm not sure which. It doesn't really matter to me. And then they did something ingenious. They wrote a program in Scratch that asks the user, how wide's the tube? What's the frequency you want to reproduce? And it tells you how long to cut the tube. And what I loved about this is, this is what I call instrumental computing. Literally and figuratively, when you think about computer programming, you often think of the result, the end product, being a computer program. In this case, the end product was a marimba. Right? And after four or five hundred adults at this conference congratulated them on being so brilliant and cute and charming, I walked up to them and I said, you know, I gotta go through all these papers you printed off the web, these tables of frequencies. 
um, isn't this about music? And the kid said, yeah. And I said, how come I can't type B flat into the program? And the kids in unison yelled, oh, grabbed their laptop and ran away. And then for the next week, their teacher was sending me updates on how they were doing with fixing their program. That was possible for two reasons. One, I knew it was possible to write such a program. And two, I knew it was possible for them to write such a program. I meet teachers all the time who are really enthusiastic and lovely human beings who love their kids and love teaching. And their kids probably love them. And they say, I got all this stuff, it's so fabulous, and I just give it to the kids and they figure out what to do and I don't even need to know anything. And I sometimes suggest, you know what would be even better? If you knew something, because then you might be able to answer a question or point them, to them towards some resources they wouldn't have access to. Or maybe throw a well-timed obstacle in their way that would lead to a powerful idea or a teachable moment. It's a good idea to have some familiarity with the world of the kids that we serve. Now, educational leadership has to be as much about subtraction as addition. We can't just keep adding. And we can't invent preposterous schemes like the flipped classroom that have no basis in research just because of our inability or unwillingness to edit a morbidly obese curriculum. It is wrong to make children do a second sh unpaid shift of homework because we can't edit a curriculum and make it relevant for them. So I want to show you a little experiment, which is kind of risky to do on my American phone in a shopping mall in Bulgaria, but we'll try. I have an iPhone here, and I'm going to set, hold the button down. Solve y equals 3x minus x cubed plus 16. Let me think about that. Here's some information. Oh, it solved the problem, it created the graph, it shows all work. Every single problem in a mathematics curriculum can be solved that way with the phone in your pocket. Now let's just keep this a secret. Don't tell the math teachers, it's going to take them three or four hundred years to figure this out. <laughs> Conrad Wolfram, the mathematics educator, businessman, software developer, estimates that we spend 106 human lifetimes per day teaching hand calculations. He tells the story in his TED talk about his eight-year-old daughter going through a period <laughs> where she was making paper laptops. She would draw a keyboard on one side, a screen on the other, fold it over, and then show them to her friends. And after she was making paper laptops for a few days, he said, you know, honey, when I was your age, I didn't make paper laptops. Why do you think that is? And she thought for a moment and said, I don't know, no paper? <laughs> if you were born after paper and computers, paper isn't better. It's not fundamental, it's not seminal. Moses didn't come down from a mountain saying kids should do maths on paper. The big idea here is, well I'm going to get to the big idea in a second. I took this photograph in Japan a couple of weeks ago. Because when you talk about maths instruction in schools, the things that parents get up in arms about, the thing that they come to the meetings with their torches and their pitchforks are yelling about, is they can always come up with an example of how they went to the mall and, the, and they couldn't make change properly. That's why we have to murder children for 12 years of meaningless mathematics. Because I went to the store and they couldn't make my change properly. Well, this was how they solved this problem in Japan. That's a cash register in Japan. There's a place where you drop the coins, there's a place where you stick the bills, and then after you scan all the items, the, the, tab, the tab is tabulated, the sum is tabulated, and the, ch and the change is spit out the bottom. No one needs to make change. Might be a handy skill, but it's no longer required. What do I mean about all this? I mean that if you make simple things easy to do, you make complexity possible. When the learner is able to know what they need to know, when they need to know it, they're able to go farther than we ever imagined it before in the past. So as a teacher, I am consumed by the question of what's the smallest seed I can plant that creates the most beautiful garden, the biggest flower. I was inspired by, by a ride at Disneyland, the enchanted tiki room, where these the lights get dim, 
and these 1960s era birds come down from the sky and they sing and dance and put on a show. And I started going into workshops and asking teachers, make a bird, singing and dancing is appreciated. And I give them 90 minutes and the Hummingbird Robotics materials, a wonderful microcontroller that's programmable in Scratch. And these teachers go on to make these beautiful, complex birds. And they edit music, and they, they, they do things that would have been 10 years with a PD in a 90-minute workshop because the prompt was good, because they had the right materials, because they have the supportive culture and expertise available to them. Can I get the sound back up, guys? This group of teachers literally didn't know the difference between greater than or less than. They could, is, my, is, it, is the crocodile's mouth this way or that way? That was their understanding of inequality. <laughs> and yet, they wanted to make the bird come alive when you approached it. So as you approach a distance sensor, <coughs> it would make the bird wake up. Well, what do you have to do if you have a sensor? First thing you have to do is find out what kind of information is it giving me? Do I have an inverse or, or, or direct relationship with the numbers? Do they go up as I get closer? Do they go down as I get closer? What's the threshold at which, what's the limit at which I trigger some behavior? And they made this bird. That's hilarious. Never send a monkey to do a bird's job. And that's how ugly it is. And what I was able to say, I had people from the Department of Education in my workshop that day, and what I was able to say to them was, there wouldn't have been a child in any of their high schools who was engaged with more sophisticated concepts than what they had created. And one of the lessons that I've learned about creating great project-based learning and inspiring people with, with awesome prompts is that the key ingredient here is a kilo of cookies. I'm sorry, a kilo. A kilo of feathers. The feathers give you courage. If I just had motors and sensors and a microcontroller and a computer, you wouldn't see a bird. But the pile of feathers makes, gives you the courage to make birds. And we could say, make birds of Bulgaria, or birds on the verge of extinction, or have birds perform Shakespeare. We could take this in a lot of different directions. I did a similar workshop where I said, make a vending machine. Everyone knows what a vending machine is. If I have, if I have a machine that does that, it's a vending machine. Maybe then I want to have it drop two. Maybe it did drop two and I only wanted one. Maybe I want to choose a red one or a blue one. Maybe I want to make it coin operated. Which coin? Does it make change? How do I know it's the right coin? How do I know it? Maybe I want to use a credit card to swipe. That started happening in workshops. The first time I did this with a room full of teachers, a group of teachers had a stuffed giraffe. And they decided their vending machine should vomit gumballs. <laughs> and they very quickly realized that puking gumballs is hard, but pooping them is relatively easy. <laughs> Which led to a really interesting discussion we could have never anticipated about evolutionary biology. <laughs> like, I wonder if that's why babies don't come out your head. <laughs> There's no curriculum writer in the world that would have anticipated that sort of serendipity. And being open to those, to those provocations and those chances to go off on a, on a tangent to modify our, our project is really exciting. So I want to share in, in closing a couple examples of some things done by teachers at a summer institute that I run every year in July. It's outside of Boston. If any of you would like to come to the United States, we'd love to have you. Um, where we have four days uninterrupted with a giant mountain of stuff and a fantastic faculty. And we just start with, what do you want to make? And all these ideas go up on the walls, we say, go do it. Last year, someone said they wanted to make massage shorts. And I dropped the mic, and he came up to me later upset and said, you made my idea sound dirty. And then, well, you, you made massage shorts. Um, they made internet browsers for chickens. They made gyms for chickens. Chickens seem to be a theme every year for some reason. Um, complete weather systems that rain and thunder and lightning. And, People create absolutely extraordinary things. Literally, teachers every summer make things that two years ago would have earned them a TED Talk and five years ago would have earned them a PhD. So here's a couple examples. On the left-hand side is using 
conductive thread and snaps and LEDs and a device called a Makey Makey that turns your entire world into a keyboard. And so when they have a digestive system and circulatory system on a t-shirt, when they point to a place on their body, an animation or a web page that, that they've created explaining an anatomical system will be displayed on the computer. They're using their body as an interface. Using conductive thread and a hotel luggage trolley to make a harp that can make harp noises or play tuba or hip hop licks or burp or anything else you want. Here's a group of teachers from around the world who never met each other before. They taught all different kinds of subjects at grade levels. They wanted to make a system that would water a plant when it got thirsty. So the first thing they did was they built a simple machine that would tilt the bottle. Then they had to figure out how does a plant tell me it's thirsty? It can't talk. Um, so they put two nails in the soil. They measured the resistance between the two nails. And when it was moist, they found out there was less resistance than when it was dry. So they connected that to the Arduino board and they programmed it to know dry or thirsty, or thirsty or not thirsty. And then they had some extra time, so they put a light sensor on it because they didn't want to have it run when it was light out because they didn't want the water to evaporate. And then they showed me something that took my breath away. They said that when they realized the distance that the nails needed to be apart, they sketched and 3D printed a nail separator. Which, you know, again, the curriculum would never say, make a nail separator. But this was the thing they needed to solve their problem. It wasn't something they could get rich on. This wasn't about entrepreneurship or being the next Steve Jobs. It was about solving the problem at hand. This is, sound again, please. This is a group of educators, including a school principal, who made a dress that responds to changes in noise or to music. Pulse it. So this is a nice bit of electronics and engineering and computer science, but it's also a dress. They made a freaking dress. They, you know, you, you, if you've done robotics with kids, you know, especially little kids, you know how frustrated they are when they build an elevator and then they don't have enough Lego left over for the building. <laughs> the fact that different people with different skills and different passions can come together and create something that's complex is really exciting. A group of educators last year at Constructing Modern Knowledge said to me, their idea was they want to make Pokemon Go. You know about Pokemon Go? Yes. This was literally five days after Pokemon Go became a thing. You remember the whole world was walking around staring at their phones and every news broadcast everywhere in the world was talking about how this amazing group of the smartest computer scientists in the universe had created this revolutionary computer software. And here I am, I have a room full of teachers, and three of them says they want, to, they want to make Pokemon Go. The voice in my head said, oh, you better stop them, they're going to fail. <laughs> my experience suggested, let it go, trust the system. If they're unsuccessful, they'll modify their, their plan. They'll do something more modest, something that's more achievable. But then a funny thing happened. Someone mentioned that there was a version of Scratch available on the web called Tailblazer that has a block that tells you GPS coordinates. If you have a version of, of Scratch that has GPS coordinates in it, it takes no effort whatsoever to make Pokemon Go. So they made one for the local community we were in with historical markers and businesses and such. They had so much extra time left over, they made one for the entire institute. So when you approached where a, different, where a group was working, it would tell you who created the project, what it was about, what materials they used. Five days earlier, we were being told that the most sophisticated computer scientists in the world had, had created this revolutionary invention. And now school teachers or third graders were capable of doing the same. So I know what you're thinking, and I'm going to come to an end in a moment. What about the curriculum? Everything you're talking about, Gary, is cute, right? Isn't this great summer camp stuff? Well, how about fractions? This is a bit of nonsense we tortured children with for several years. I was working in a school in Los Angeles where learn numerator and denominator was written on the whiteboard for so long you could no longer erase it. You'd either have to chip it off or throw out the whiteboard and buy a new one. It was the ninth month of the school year, and I had just had it. And I walked into the classroom and I yelled, the first kid who writes a program in Logo that allows me to type any fraction in, and I'm going to try some hard fractions, and draws me a representation of that fraction as parts of a circle, I'll take you out for lunch. I wasn't sure I was allowed to do that, 
Two little girls said, can we work together? I said, you're always allowed to work together. And the next day, three 10-year-old girls handed me this program that indeed lets me type any fraction in and draws me a graphical representation of it as parts of a circle. And what really angers me is all that the damned curriculum asks of these kids is which vocabulary word is the top one and which is the bottom one. You might as well be teaching them Swahili. It's just a vocabulary exercise. It has nothing to do with mathematics. And yet we'll spend a year or two on this nonsense. And in this case, not only were they able to understand the concept in two days, but they were dealing with angle measure and circumference and diameter and, oh, variable, because their variables are named numerator and denominator. So, one last example. A group of teachers and principal came up to me in Australia and they told me they have a kid in their school, the high school, he's not very good at school, but he builds these elaborate machines, he calls himself a steampunk. And he told me over and over again that he had low literacy skills. And I thought, well, you know, call me a crazy radical, I'm a fan of literacy. We shouldn't just dismiss the fact that he's got low literacy skills because he can build these machines, but look at the kinds of machines he can build. So that's compressed gas, open flames, really sharp objects. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, and I know from my own work, I spent three years working inside a prison for teenagers where we created an alternative learning environment that was project-based, multi-age, technology-rich, where kids could work five hours a day uninterrupted on personally meaningful projects. That kids who were often considered ineducable, uneducable, had great talent and potential and passion and, and skill and, and knowledge. We just had to figure out a way to connect to it. And so as I said, because I'm a fan of literacy, I asked a few questions. Does your school subscribe to any computer magazines? I've been in schools with 2,000 computers and not a single computer book or magazine in the library. Right? Has he read any Jules Verne? The kid calls himself a steampunk. I am completely confident that I could get him to read 19th century science fiction. And once he read 19th century Victorian science fiction, in a couple of days or weeks, he would catch up to his peers and he would be part of what Frank Smith called the Literacy Club. We can use what they're hot about uh, to, to warm up things they may not be so hot about. My major concern is when do kids become good at something? How do we create a productive context for learning where we don't endlessly interrupt them and, and, and bombard them with meaningless trivia so that they can actually develop the habits of mind and the skills that will serve them for a lifetime. There are a million and one kinds of projects. I'll just share this last one. The current issue of Make Magazine has biohacking on the cover. You can now hack DNA. You can manipulate DNA in the classroom, in your kitchen. Now, for me, DNA was Three letters for words I can't pronounce, that I don't understand what they mean, and that squiggly thing. But if you could actually manipulate them, if you could actually have that experience, you would be a scientist and you would have a much more intimate relationship with the concept than just being told about it or, or memorizing terms. And the last thing I want to share with you, lest you think that I'm some silly utopian from, from the United States, um, MIT, arguably the best math and science institution in, in the world, decided three years ago that they were adding a maker portfolio section to their undergraduate admissions application. Because they figure if you're applying to MIT, you're probably good at math and science, you probably have good scores, good grades. Why would being a maker be important to them? Because this is what differentiates you. You have persistence and curiosity and 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 resourcefulness and talent and drive and you were willing to make and learn and create without there being a grade dangled in front of you or a gun put to your head. That, that they recognize the people who can solve the problem that school hasn't taught them to solve, who are willing to be learners outside of the classroom are the kids who are going to be the best mathematicians and scientists and artists and chefs and anything else they want to be in the future. And the best piece of advice I could leave you with is less us, more them.
Anytime you think you should intervene on behalf of some educational transaction, ask yourself the question, is there less that I can do and more that they can do? Whenever we shift more agency to the learner, they gain the greatest benefit from it. I thank you for your attention, your good humor, the work that you do on behalf of kids and making the world a better place for them. Thanks very much.